Mr. Griffin, can you please turn your camera on? Hi, yes, thanks. Thank you.
I think we're ready to go. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I want to begin by noting some important requirements. Uh, standing House and Committee rules will continue to apply during hybrid proceedings. All members are reminded that they are expected to adhere to these rules, including decorum. House regulations require members to be visible through a video connection throughout the proceeding, so please keep your cameras on. Also, please remember to remain muted until you are recognized to minimize background noise. In the event a member encounters technical issues that prevent him or her from being recognized for their questioning, I will move to the next available member of the same party, and I will recognize that member at the next appropriate time slot, provided that they have returned to the proceeding. And with that, I'll begin with my opening statement. Increasing the flow of capital to American small businesses is one of this committee's foundational goals. When entrepreneurs can secure financing on reasonable terms, they create jobs, expand their businesses, and move the economy forward. Unfortunately, most American business owners feel that they cannot adequately access capital. According to a 2022 Federal Reserve survey, 59% of small employer firms said they have unmet financing needs. So we must find ways to fill that gap and deliver more funding to small firms on safe and responsible terms. Massive developments in financial technology, commonly known as fintech, have shown real promise for expanding access to credit for small firms. Over the years, entrepreneurs have flocked to fintechs for their capital needs. One study found that by 2016, non-bank lenders had a market share of close to 60% in the small business lending sector. During the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, we witnessed the ability of fintechs to make small-dollar PPP loans to small businesses, particularly those in underserved communities more effectively than traditional banks could. Small businesses often turn to fintechs for their speedy approval process, more diverse financing options, and alternative metrics for credit worthiness. However, while fintech lending has helped many entrepreneurs, concerns are growing that industry practices may harm and even target small businesses. For instance, the speed at which fintech lenders deploy capital can come at a very substantial cost. A conventional bank loan typically carries an APR of 4 to 13 percent. For fintechs, APRs for online loans and other financing products can start at 7 percent and can climb higher than 100 percent. 
These terms are not always clear to small businesses, as many online lenders provide little or no information up front to prospective borrowers about the loan or the product and often use metrics other than APR to disclose the cost of capital. Some online lenders also engage in predatory practices that put small businesses particularly at risk. For example, Merchant Cash Advances, MCAs, allow a lender to receive a fixed percentage of future sales until the financing is repaid. The extremely high interest rates and daily repayments associated with MCAs can cause businesses to enter into an out-of-control debt spiral. Furthermore, many MCA lenders require that borrowers sign an, sign an obscure legal instrument known as a confession of judgment to get the money. By signing that, borrowers waive their legal rights regarding any legal dispute that might arise. And when a court enforces the confession of judgment, it locks a small firm into that unsustainable debt cycle and ultimately forces the business to close. Small business advocates also worry about the lack of transparency around fintech underwriting. The data and algorithms that control automatic underwriting can pull unrelated information like who an applicant follows on social media or the number of criminal records in an applicant's zip code. These underwriting practices lack transparency and have the potential to unfairly deny credit to protected groups or make those products more expensive for all. As the fintech sector evolves, Congress must keep pace and ensure industry practices are not unfairly taking advantage of the entrepreneurs, especially those who may be vulnerable to abusive practices. So today, I look forward to discussing the benefits and risks of fintech lending for small businesses and what this committee can do to both protect and expand opportunities for entrepreneurs. With that, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Ms. Van Dyne, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A little over an hour ago, uh, the latest CPI numbers peaked at a whopping year-over-year -year increase of 9.1%. Maybe even more shocking is that inflation rose 1.3% from just a month ago. This month of surging inflation is just the latest in a long line of pain-inflicting pain inflicting economic numbers that have come under President Biden, Biden's leadership. At this point, one thing is clear. Small businesses and our communities cannot prosper, let alone survive, if this administration's current policies and frivolous spending continue. Over a year ago, Congress forced through their $1.9 trillion reconciliation package. Americans now feel the full inflationary effects that Republicans were warning of. Filling up at the gas station is now a shocking experience. Grocery store visits cost over 12 percent more, and housing prices are almost untenable. There is no doubt we are now paying for this administration's free money policies. And unfortunately, it seems that we've reached the point of deja vu. As labor shortages and supply chain troubles persist, we are back to talks of another trillion dollar reconciliation package. And if that wasn't bad enough, Democrats plan to include tax increases on small businesses in this proposed bill. While details are still developing, I want to say loud and clear that any changes or expansions of the net investment income tax will be a tax on small businesses passed through entities. When I visit the small businesses that make North Texas one of the quickest growing areas in the United States, they tell me the same thing. The government needs to stay out of the way. As we're all well aware, small business owners are some of the best America has to offer. And yet they struggle to be optimistic when it seems they are working against a tough economy and a government that just won't listen. According to a survey by NFIB, the number of small business owners expecting business conditions to improve has continued to go down, decreasing every month this year. Every American knows this is a difficult moment, but luckily we can turn the tide back in favor of, an ec of economic growth. We can put small businesses back in the driver's seat by ending the trillions of dollars in reckless spending and aggressively reforming regulations. In addition to these challenges, access to capital remains an important issue for American small businesses, as it could be the difference between business expansion or business stagnation. At today's hearing, title suggests small business lending must include an examination of just how small business fairness over the last two years during the COVID-19 pandemic and how fintech lenders performed during the Paycheck Protection Program. And anything less would shortchange this topic. Given that this oversight committee hearing, I'd be remiss not to mention my disappointment that we have yet to hear from Secretary Yellen regarding her legal and statutory requirement to testify. Across the board, these are important issues and topics that deserve the attention of this subcommittee and members of Congress. And I look forward to today's conversation. I would like to thank all the witnesses that are here today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. 
Thank you, Ms. Van Dyne. Uh, the gentlelady yields back. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our witnesses today. Our first witness is Mr. Sean Salas, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Camino Financial, a digitally native community development financial institution known as CDFIs, with a variety of small business loan offerings for firms of all sizes, including solopreneurs. A signatory of the Small Business Borrower's Bill of Rights, Camino is an example of how to lend to small businesses online in a fair and transparent manner. We welcome you, Mr. Salas. Our second witness is Ms. Joyce Klein, Senior Director of the Business Ownership Initiative at the Aspen Institute. A central focus of her work over 20 years includes examining the role of business ownership and microfinance in addressing the challenges of racial inequity and the racial wealth gap. She was also instrumental in helping start the Responsible Business Lending Coalition, which advocates for responsible practices and transparency in the small business lending sector. We welcome you, Ms. Klein, and look forward to your testimony. Our third witness is Ms. Diane Patterson, the Regional Director of the Twin Cities Small Business Development Center, SBDC, at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, in her capacity, she counsels small business owners on locating funding sources for working capital and expansion, and is certified as an economic development finance professional and revolving loan fund expert by the National Development Council. She's also a former business owner herself and brings a valuable and multifaceted perspective to our discussion of these important issues. We welcome you, Ms. Patterson, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, now I'd you'd like to yield to the ranking member, Ms. Van Dyne, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our, network, our next witness is John Griffin. Uh, Dr. Griffin is the James A. Elkins Centennial Chair in Finance at the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas in Austin. With a focus on banking, international finance, and structured finance, Ms. Dr. Griffin has been a professor at Arizona State University, Yale University, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Harvard Business School. In addition to teaching, Dr. Griffin has conducted extensive research and published findings on numerous banking topics, including the 2008-2009 financial crisis. His and his team's most recent research examines the intersection of fintech lending within the Paycheck Protection Program, also known as PPP. Dr. Griffin, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to your testimony. I'd also like to thank all the witnesses for joining us. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Van Dyne. Uh, and now to you, Mr. Salas. You're recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Phillips and Ranking Member Van Dyne and other members of the subcommittee. I really appreciate it and, I'm, and, and I am honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Sean Salas and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Camino Financial. Camino Financial is a fintech lending platform that empowers entrepreneurs to grow their business and boost access to capital for underserved communities. Our microloans provide small business owners with the flexible financing they need to thrive in a competitive market. We are a National Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI, that is pioneering affordable credit through technology and AI. Our mission is simple, to build generational wealth in underserved communities. We take a digital first approach and applications are 100% online. We predominantly serve entrepreneurs in California, but our digital first approach allows us to serve businesses in other states. Today, I'm proud to say that we're one of the largest Latino-focused small business lenders in the US. Over the last six years, we've helped over 9,500 small businesses deploying over 200, almost $200 million in capital. We've also created one of the largest bilingual content hubs that offers entrepreneurs over 1,200 bilingual articles related to business and entrepreneurship that reaches hundreds of thousands of website visitors per month. We provide a camino, or a pathway, to capital by educating our borrowers. This pathway involves providing resources that teach them how to formalize their business and access the tools they need to get on a path to qualify for larger, lower interest rate loans. I founded Camino Financial with my brother, Kenny, while completing our MBAs at Harvard Business School. We are the proud sons of a Mexican entrepreneur who truly sought the American dream. Our mother opened over 30 restaurants in Southern California while raising six children. Imagine that. Unfortunately, when I was 12 years old, her entire business collapsed. She moved us to Mexico to restart our lives despite us being US citizens. The moment Kenny and I graduated from high school in Mexico, we decided to immigrate back to the US to pursue what my mom had lost, the American dream. 
We were lucky enough to be admitted to UC Berkeley and thereafter build our careers in finance. While working in finance, we realized the capital gap of investing in micro businesses in minority communities. So we decided to leverage our MBA experience to incubate Camino Financial to help businesses like my mother's grow to a point where they can access a broader suite of wealth building solutions. Now for context, the average Latino business earns around $250,000 in revenue per year. That's about half of the national average. Most Latino owned businesses are micro businesses, not even small businesses, with four or less employees. Banks and larger institutions um, uh, and, and, and larger institutional investors do not actively service this lower end of the market, comprising over 97% of Latino businesses with an unmet credit demand of north of $20 billion. I'd like to share a few examples of entrepreneurs we help. Leticia, business owner and restaurant owner, needed a business loan during a busy season to hire and train more staff. She never received a business loan and needed guidance. After submitting her application, a Camino Financial business loan specialist called her with, within minutes to walk her through the process that, so that she can train and hire more staff. Prior to working with us, Valdemar, who owns a car repair and maintenance shop, used personal loans for his business. After realizing that personal loans were not sufficient for his business, he worked for Camino Financial to buy inventory and increase his company's efficiency and profits. People like Leticia and Baldemar reach out to Camino Financial because of our easy digital application, because we are a digital first company and a lot of our business is done online. Now that said, transparency is critical to our success. That's why we joined the Responsible Business Lending Coalition. That's also why we support the efforts of Chairwoman Nidia Velasquez to create protections for small business owners. We believe that borrowers should have access to responsible loans and information that allows them to uniformly compare and select the financing that makes sense for them. I should also note that Cal in California, we're all already required to disclose much of our information to help protect borrowers. And while I'm not here to discuss our competitors, I will say that California's interest and fee disclosures are not hindering our business, they're leveling the playing field. In the end, our business is about helping entrepreneurs achieve the American dream. It's my hope that we continue to grow, will help many more budding entrepreneurs live that American dream. Thank you for your time and the privilege to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Salas. Uh, and with that, uh, I welcome you, Ms. Klein. You're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Van Dyne, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me <clears throat> to appear before the Oversight, Investigation, and Regulation Subcommittee today to speak with you about the importance of transparency and the role of financial technology in small business lending. My name is Joyce Klein, and I am the Senior Director of the Aspen Institute's Business Ownership Initiative. At the Business Ownership Initiative, we work to understand the needs of and the barriers facing the most underserved small businesses and to develop solutions for reaching them. We've been doing this work at the Aspen Institute for 30 years, and over that time, we've seen many changes in the financial services landscape. Um, but one constant is that entrepreneurs still face challenges in accessing capital. And this is particularly true for certain types of entrepreneurs. It's true for women, for people of color, for immigrants, for those in rural communities. I also serve as the chair of the Responsible Business Lending Coalition, which is a network of nonprofit and for-profit lenders like Sean and Camino, um, investors and small business advocates. And we share a commitment to innovation and in small business lending but also concerns about the rise of irresponsible small business lending practices. And so my remarks today draw from both our work at the Aspen Institute and from the work of the Responsible Business Lending Coalition. So when consider considering the implications of FinTech for small business lending, it's important to focus on financial technology in its broadest sense, which involves the application of digital technologies to financial transactions. And today, virtually every small business lender, whether they're a bank or a credit union or a CDFI or a fintech firm or some other type of commercial finance company is using financial technology. Um, and there are many ways in which financial technology can help expand access to capital to those who have been excluded from or marginalized in our capital markets. Um, but through our work, we've learned that if the goal is to expand access to responsible capital, it's not the type of institution that's providing the financing or whether and how they use technology that's most important. What's most important is getting the financing products right and the financial practices right. 
So with regard to products, we're, we've seen product progress in increasing lending to underserved businesses. It's when lenders offer smaller loans and they underwrite by focusing on cash flow and a flexible approach to credit histories rather than by focusing on collateral, equity, and credit scores. And the right practices are also essential in reaching segments of the small business market that haven't been reached by banks. And this is where CDFIs are particularly adept, and it's where fintech can bring technology that's accessible and user-friendly. But we have to balance greater access with borrower protections. The economics of smaller dollar small business lending are really challenging, and that creates pressure to sometimes use practices that can be extractive or even predatory. And so this brings me back to our work with the RBLC, where we've created the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. The BBOR puts the small business at the center of the financing transaction, identifying six rights we believe should be upheld. And first among these is the right to transparent pricing and terms. Um, the RBLC has been part of diverse coalitions that have been successful in passing small business truth and lending legislation in California and in New York. Um, and the RBLC is grateful for the work that Chairwoman Media Velasquez has done to promote transparency and responsible practices in small business financing, including her leadership in introducing H.R. 6054, the Small Business Lending Disclosure Act of 2021, which would require lenders to disclose information that enables small businesses to make informed choices. So, you know, the original Truth in Lending Act was not applied to some commercials financing because it was assumed that businesses had financial expertise that consumers did not. And while that's true for some businesses, it's not true for most. So most small businesses in the U.S. are sole proprietors. They're not corporations. And they're home daycare centers and cleaning and landscape businesses and food trucks and small retail shops, hair and nail salons. They do their own books and finances. They may, but they may not even have access to a part-time bookkeeper or accountant to help them. And with the emergence of new small business lending financing products has come greater variation in how those products are structured and priced. And so we believe it's vital that when small business owners seek financing, they have the information to fully understand the cost and the terms of each offer to compare across those products and make the best choice for their business. And central to that is the disclosure of APR, annual percentage rate, which is the only metric that allows borrowers to make apples to apples comparisons across products. And I, I note that lack of transparency actually inhibits competition. Market competition relies on price disclosure without transparent disclosure on pricing that allows borrowers to compare costs. Financing companies don't have an incentive to innovate and compete on price. So as a result, um, they- Ms. Klein, your, your five minutes have expired, expensive. so if you could wrap it up. Okay, thank you. thank you so much for the ability um, to, to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank, thank you. you so thank you very much. And now I recognize uh, my fellow Minnesotan, Ms. Patterson, for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Phillips and Ranking Member Van Dyne. Um, my name is Diane Patterson, and I am the Regional Director of the Small Business Development Center in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. We've been a SBDC for over 31 years. Um, the SBDC program is a national program that is a matching partnership program with the SBA and organizations of higher ed. We work with all kinds of businesses, um, small uh, to medium generally, startup to exit planning. Um, so we've seen a lot of businesses we worked with a lot of businesses during the recession, and we certainly had a great deal of businesses coming to us during the pandemic. With today's online credit lending environment, where many FinTech services offer a four minute application and 24 hour turnaround to access funds, the SBDC is seeing small business owners navigating confusing fine print, adverse interest rates, short loan terms, and prepayment penalties. These lending practices are especially harmful to small, young, less profitable, and minority-owned businesses who already struggle to access financing because they lack the business history or collateral that traditional banks require. Yes, the ease and speed with which small businesses borrowers can access FinTech credit is appealing these businesses tend to use this loan option in, in conjunction with other forms of credit, making them financially vulnerable. The application process for traditional lender takes days. 
The approval process itself can take weeks or longer, depending on the meeting schedule of the loan committee. Standing in stark contrast, two FinTech options, biz to credit and Blue Line, advertise four and five minute completion times respectively. Both promise next day availability of funds. While FinTech loans address pain points in the loan application process, these loans subject borrowers to much higher interest rates and other terms that cause many to default. The biggest issue in FinTech lending practices is the lack of transparency in the price of their products. As consumers, we're accustomed to seeing rates of five and a half to six and a half APR. This commonly understood annual percentage rate terminology is familiar, it makes sense. FinTech borrowers read rates ranging from three and a half to four and a half percent and assume they are APR. What they do not realize is the FinTech rates are regularly calculated on a daily basis. That results in a lending relationship that subjects the borrower to an interest rate in the range of 58 to 63%. Simply put, FinTech lending practices are an issue with this daily calculation, the first of several fine print problems. On deck interest rates are posted at three and a half to 5%, but in reality, they range from 24.6 to 58.6%. Cabbage, on the other hand, advertises a loan fee instead of an interest rate. Lending Club charges 9.77% to 35.71% interest, but then assigns an additional loan origination fee ranging from 1.99% to 8.99%. The cost of FinTech credit is high. The terminology is confusing. Adding more fuel to the fire is the repayment terms, which are traditionally very short. FinTech loan terms typically are six to 12 months. This greatly impacts the level of the borrower's monthly debt service. While many FinTech lenders offer weekly installments, that doesn't change the reality that these payments are often too large for a small business's cash flow to digest. To illustrate, a client of the Small Business Development Center founded a craft brewery operation making gluten-free beer. Due to the nature of their product, they were unable to brew beer using other craft brewers' equipment during the startup phase. As such, they financed new machinery using a $375,000 loan from a bank. The tap room was an instant revenue generator, but the revenue from distribution lagged behind their projections. They approached their bank for a second loan for $100,000 working capital to bridge until the distribution and side Ms. of the Patterson, your time's up. up. So if you could just, if you could wrap it up, we'd appreciate it. Yes. So thank you very much. The debt service for that business was $11,208 a month. That's still too high. But thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Uh, and now I recognize Dr. Griffin for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Van Dyme, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before the Small Business Subcommittee to speak to you about FinTech lending. I'm John Griffin, a forensic finance professor at the University of Texas and also founder of Integra FEC, a small consulting business which investigates financial fraud. This testimony is based on my academic paper with co-authors Professor Sam Kruger and Pratik Mahajan entitled, Did FinTech Lenders Facilitate PPP Fraud? Found with links from my website and SSRN. I'll briefly summarize some of the main findings of our paper and then discuss the potential policy implications. Our paper analyzes the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program, called PPP, based on four main metrics of potential misreporting, which are cross-verified with against each other and with seven additional indicators. The main findings of the paper are, first, misreporting indicators consistently concentrate in fintech lenders. Overall, fintechs are 6.5 times more likely to process misreported loans. Second, misreporting is not a simple function of dispersing funds quickly in early 2020. To the contrary, misreporting steadily increased throughout the program. At the end of the PPP program, in May 2021, 
the level of suspicious lending through fintechs are four times the level at the start of the program. Third, our four main measures place the magnitude of likely fraud at 64 billion, but our additional indicators and analysis point to 117 billion. Since these analyses use only public data and take a conservative approach, the total amounts are likely even larger. Finally, we find that suspicious loans are being overwhelmingly forgiven by the SBA at similar rates to other loans and extremely few are prosecuted. A key result can be seen in figure two from our paper, which is reproduced also in my report. The red and light yellow are FinTech lenders and the lenders in gray are traditional banks. The top 12 lenders with the most misreporting are all FinTech and are all shown at the left of the graph. Though there are also some problems at traditional banks, most traditional banks are to the middle and to the right of the graph with consistently lower levels of misreporting. Interestingly, however, not all fintech lenders have high rates of misreporting. Our findings have important policy implications. First, the PPP program did not include robust verification requirements. This led to substantial costs to taxpayers, particularly in 2021, when there was less concerns to distribute funds quickly. Second, fintech lending, though praised for getting funds out quickly, needs substantial improvement in due diligence practices. Two fintech lenders with an established track record persistently have low rates of misreporting, indicating that online lending itself need not be substandard. Third, three leading academic papers cited in my report show that the PPP saved relatively few jobs at an exceedingly high cost per job. Along with our evidence, this indicates that the PPP program was an ineffective use of taxpayer dollars and should cause one to reconsider the efficacy of future SBA lending programs. Fourth, incentives in the PPP appear misaligned and that FinTech lenders with few employees, relatively little track record and lax due diligence procedures made billions of dollars dispersing fraudulent loans. In my opinion, the FinTech organizations and individuals who facilitated such activities should not be allowed to engage in future government programs. Fifth, the increasing scale of fraud through time indicates that the fraudsters targeted the program and current penalty and enforcement systems are not effective. If the system is not changed for future SBA lending programs, the most likely outcome is even more of the same. Government agencies can assist in transparency by making more detailed data widely available. Finally, though we should try to design better systems for the future, fraudsters typically find new holes in the system. This is why I believe that serving justice for financial crime is not simply old fashioned and backward looking as some might think, but rather forward looking as well. Our analysis shows us that less than one in 10,000 loans with a misreporting indicator has been prosecuted. Without prosecuting organizations and networks of individuals who stole billions of dollars from US taxpayers, these same individuals will most likely mount even more costs for society going forward. Additionally, justice serves as a warning to others and deters future crime. Much more can and must be done. Other important details can be found in our academic paper online. Thank you for your attention to these important issues. I look forward to further questions. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, uh, and thanks to all of our witnesses. We appreciate uh, everything that you have shared with us. Uh, I'll now begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, my first question is to you, Ms. Patterson. Uh, we all know the SBA has not yet allowed fintechs to participate in programs other than PPP, uh, but they've clearly shown potential in expanding access to capital for small businesses. Uh, however, their involvement in the wider small business lending sector and in PPP specifically have also raised serious fraud and transparency-related concerns, as we've heard in testimony. Uh, you detail in your testimony that guidelines to set uniformity in fintech lending practices specific to the cost of capital uh, would be worthy solutions. Uh, to this issue. So my question is, what should the SBA uh, and this committee specifically focus on as it deliberates on the potential involvement of fintech specifically in SBA lending programs, particularly given that in SBA lending programs, the agency often sets the underwriting terms? Primarily, um, and, and all the witnesses mentioned this, it's the transparency piece, um, as well as a reporting piece. We really don't have good data regarding the default rate of fintech loans. Um, we surmise that it's much higher than traditional lending, 
we really don't have that data. But from a borrower standpoint, the transparency is is key. When you tell a client that their interest rate is 58.6 and they thought it was 4.5, that's a that's really hard for that business to digest. The other thing that we're seeing is once we the borrower understands the terms that they have signed on to are the prepayment penalties, which can be as high as 20%. And so when they recognize that they are paying 60% interest rate and they want to refinance that loan, they have difficulty doing so because it's principal plus the prepayment penalty. And so we don't see them refinanced. I've only seen one, and that was actually that craft brewery because the bank was nervous that they would not get their original 375 back. So I just think in, in from a regulatory standpoint, I love the accessibility of fintech loans, but we need that transparency so that borrowers truly understand the loan documents that they are signing, the interest rate and what that impacts if the if the term is only six months to to a year. All right. Th- thank you, Ms. Patterson. So now, Mr. Salas, I'll turn to you uh, on the same subject. Um, I, many of us believe that online lenders should adopt the same disclosure and transparency policies uh, of traditional banks. Uh, and some of them, have already, some fintechs have already adopted those. But can you detail for all of us uh, some of the policies that you've adopted uh, and the importance uh, of those policies relative to this issue? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're already regulated under truth in lending-like laws in California, where we disclose to our members in a clear and simple manner uh, terms. And one of the most critical, what I'd say, metrics in in pushing transparency and creating a level playing field is APR. Mm -hmm. Uh, We believe that APR is comparable across different credit products, uh, that it need that every lender needs to use their best commercial efforts to disclose that APR at their earliest convenience. And uh, we have not been hindered at all from a business perspective in that disclosure. And we have found that by having that requirement under law, uh, it creates for a more fair and competitive marketplace, which ultimately benefits the borrower. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, And with my one minute left, Dr. Griffin, to you, your chart and report on fintechs and fraud uh, was quite stunning to me. and not all fintech lenders, although uh, in that chart, have high misreporting rates. Two of them, in fact, were uh, among the better in the entire graph. So, so what features distinguish the fintechs with low misreporting rates from those with high misreporting rates, in your estimation? Great, great question, actually. I think the, the difference is those two of the lenders that are, have very low misreporting rates were actually established uh, established businesses that have been in the fintech business for a while. And most of the lenders with low rates of misreporting were kind of new lenders that developed, had little track record, little reputation to protect, and um, probably little in the way of established procedures. And so with little reputation to protect and and um, nothing but uh, potential of probably low potential of being prosecuted, these some of these fintech lenders seem to have just uh, opened the door to, to rampant uh, mortgage fraud. Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, with that, my time has expired. And now I recognize the gentlewoman from Texas and the ranking member of this committee, Rep. Van Dyne, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Griffin, I'd like to start by uh, looking at some of your findings. In your testimony, you state that, quote, misreporting is not a simple function of getting money out the door quickly in 2020. In fact, the fraud at the end of the month of the program in May 2021 is four times the level at the start of the program, end quote. This is an astounding finding and one that is really not discussed very widely. Um, Can you talk to us more about why this is the case? Yes, thank you. Um, Yes, it it surprised us as well. Well, it appears to be that fraudulent networks um, kind of ramped up their activities in terms of getting more and more PPP funds and probably knowing which fintech lenders would uh, rubber stamp these these loans. Um, I say that because we find that in the very geographies in round one and round one and two, where there is high levels of misreporting, 
And those same zip codes that where there was some levels of misreporting in rounds one and two, the, where the rounds increased dramatically in rounds three and four. So it seems, and we also find evidence that it spreads through social networks online. So we think that kind of people, people initially went in, got FinTech loans, and, and then spread this uh, through networks in a massive scale and it increased over time. That also indicates that fraudsters are fairly sophisticated. And if we engage in, in such type of SBA lending again, they're going to likely target this on a massive scale. Well, that actually brings me to my next point. I'm, I want to turn to your fourth finding, which you state that suspicious loans are being overwhelmingly forgiven at similar rates to other loans, and very few are being prosecuted, indicating that substantial reforms in SBA lending are needed. This is concerning, and the SBA has indeed fully or partially forgiven 90% of all PPP loans as of July 10th, 2022. So I'm going to use your word. Do you believe that we're giving a free pass to the fraudsters? that are abusing the programs and American taxpayer dollars and the na nation's small businesses? Um, I, I have no idea why all these loans are being forgiven, quite frankly. I mean, SBA themselves recognizes that there's a real problem with fraudulent lo lo loans. And so um, our, we were kind of shocked to find that <laughs> the, the rate of the loans are being forgiven among the likely fraudulent and non are essentially the same, and so I I don't uh, I don't understand that it would be a simple matter of any loan with a questionable indicator simply being flagged and and wait uh, to to forgive that loan and and that procedure could take a while to thoroughly investigate. I think there's uh, much as I mentioned in our paper, we're only using public data, so. There's also a lot of private data that the SBA has access to and likely indicates the problem is even greater than, than we've identified in our paper. Wow. Um, have you or your team researched or examined fraud within the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, IDLE? Uh, we did briefly look at it, and we uh, we do think that there's it's not in the paper, but we do we did find quite a bit of fraud in IDLE as well. Do you have any idea? I mean, do you have more information than just? I think we all I don't know have that the they exact, did. But I don't. Do I don't have the exact dollar amounts on okay. my, my table, but it, it was as a fraction of the program. It was it was quite large. I mean, one of the one of our indicators is the difference in in jobs uh, reported to the IDLE program as well as the PPP program. So you'll see that some um, there are, there are many bars which said they had ten. To, had 10 jobs in their business when they reported to IDLE. And yet when they applied to PPP, they're, they're only one person. And those loans, uh, we also constrained on timing so that those, those two representations were made at almost the same time. So it's very, um, there was a huge mismatch between the programs. So in, in my last 40 seconds, um, I don't believe members can have a full and thorough conversation on fintech lending without further exploring um, how they performed over the last two years, and especially you had mentioned earlier their performance within the nearly $800 billion PPP. So what are the, some of the top lessons that members should take away from your PPP fintech research? Thanks. Well, I think some of the top lessons are that um, just focus on getting money out the door quickly is is not necessarily a, a great goal. We had traditional lending guidelines in place and those lending guidelines could have been followed. We don't know why the traditional banks did better, but if you talk to people at traditional banks, they'll say they follow the same processes and procedures they used before. And those processes and procedures, those due diligence uh, procedures where banks actually had a stake and could lose money if the loans defaulted, those procedures seem to have worked a lot better. So in general, I think I don't think it's a good state, a good idea for the government to give out money without um, and, and allow lenders to give out these money, money without repercussions where they also have a skin in the game and lose money if the loans default. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back. And the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentle lady's time has expired. I'm sorry. Uh, and now I recognize uh, the gentle lady from New York and the chairwoman of the Small Business Committee, uh, Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Um, Ms. Klein, can you explain how underserved 
small businesses are susceptible to predatory lending practices and why legislation is needed to ensure all small business loans contain fair and accurate disclosures about costs and terms. Yes, thank you so much for that question, Congresswoman and, and Chair Velasquez. And that, as I noted in my testimony, you know, the, the Truth in Lending Act was originally not applied to consumer tran commercial transactions because it was assumed that businesses had access to financial and in some cases access to legal expertise. Um, but And that's true for large firms, but it's certainly not for the smallest firms. And I, I think both Ms. Patterson and and, and Sean gave some really good examples of the kinds of small firms that they work with. And, and I, I think one of the things that's also really important, not only to understand is, you know, that these firms don't necessarily have this level of financial expertise. The other thing that's important to note is that in many cases, a small business owner's personal and their business finances are closely connected. So a small business owner often uses her personal credit score when she's applying for credit, um, she may pledge personal assets or make a personal guarantee against the financing that she's receiving. And often when there's a mismatch between sort of income or revenues and expenses, she's drawing on her personal savings where she's choosing not to pay herself so that she can meet her other financial obligations. And so I think this assumption of who small business owners are that was, you know, it, the reason behind not a, a, a sort of applying the original Truth in Lending Act to commercial transactions just doesn't quite hold up. So what we want is we want business owners to be able to make the best choices that reflect their financial circumstances, their personal circumstances, their business circumstances. And that's why truth in lending-like disclosures are really needed for small business loans. So Thank they you. have the information they need. Thank you. And Ms. Klein, uh, my legislation, uh, Truth in Lending Bill, gives the CFPB regulatory authority to include small business loans and financing products. Given that CFPB already has jurisdiction over the Truth in Lending Act and Section 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which vastly improves small business lending data collection, do you agree the CFPB is the appropriate federal agency for overseeing this space? Yes, and I would speak here both in, both wearing my Aspen Institute hat and the Responsible Business Lending Coalition hat. We agree that there's an existing framework at CFPB that's based on its oversight of existing TILA protections for consumers and that that provides a, a good foundation for extending these protections to small businesses seeking financing. And my legislation uh, will create a federal regulatory floor, meaning that states can enact stronger protections than in federal law. However, I have heard that to prevent jurisdiction shopping by online lenders, federal law should establish a ceiling instead and preempt state law in this space. What are your thoughts on whether federal law should preempt states in regulating these lenders and products? So I'd say, you know, our frame again, as we start, is to start with the interest of the small business owner. And from that perspective, your legislation, HR 64, already does the most important thing, which is to require the right set of disclosures that includes APR. And we think small business owners across the country deserve that information. So um, with regard to preemption, I'm going to speak based on my work at the Aspen Institute. And then if like, if needed, I'll clarify later the formal position of the Responsible Business Lending Coalition. But from the persp perspective of my own work, I think a federal standard is really helpful. Many lenders, CDFIs, um, fintech lenders, other lenders work in multiple states, in some cases nationwide, and having one set of required disclosure would be more efficient for them. It would enable, if we want financing costs to go down over time, I think a strong national standard is the way to go. Thank you. And New York and California have both passed truth in lending laws for small business loans, and in implementing them, they carve out floor plan financing and real estate investment property from the lost coverage. Are those exemptions something we should consider at the federal law level? Um, thank you. I, I think our preference as the Responsible Business Lending Coalition would be to have all small business lenders subject to the same requirements for all products. I think that creates a uh, you know, a, a level regulatory playing field that doesn't preference some types of products or lenders over others, which I think is important. However, I'll also note we did, you know, 
support the final legislation that passed in California and New York. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. And now I recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member, Van Dyne, as well, <clears throat> for holding this hearing. Thanks to all of our witnesses. Uh, certainly, I think we all know small business today are facing tremendous challenges. <clears throat> it's somewhat of an endless list from inflation to labor shortages to all kinds of supply chain disruptions, uh, unpredictable new regulations, and of course, challenges to access, uh, access to capital. Um, so, you know, Dr. Griffin, very interested in your testimony as well as uh, uh, the graphs and all that you provided us. So when you speak of the, um, uh, the issues uh, from the, the lending on PPP, uh, you meant re related to fintechs as well, of course. Uh, do you think there's an, is there an 80-20 rule? 20% uh, or 80% of the fraud was coming from 20% of the participants? Would you say that's perhaps uh, uh, fair or maybe you could elaborate on that some? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Yes, I think that the fraud is, is likely um, perpetuated by a smaller number of actors than you might think because our analysis shows that the fraud is concentrated in, in certain CBSAs and even within those C CBSAs concentrated in certain zip codes. That indicates that it's not just um, a few people getting this idea randomly and uh, applying for the loans, but rather organized networks, recruiting people, getting fees, um, maybe coordinating with other organizations to facilitate the fraud. So I think it's an organized, um, our, our evidence indicates it's, it has an organized fashion to it and um, that, that the likely number of players that were orchestrating at least the rampant fraud is uh, is is probably more more aligned with like a you know five five percent of the people doing doing uh, ninety percent of the ninety percent of the fraud. Great, thank you, Mr. Salas. I want to ask you a question, if uh, if I can, please. The um, so what do you consider to be the um, your biggest concerns and and or your customers' largest concerns in uh, their needs for access to capital. In a way, why does your company exist when you know there's community banks and and everything else out there? And also, um, what is your uh, feeling ab ab about you know there's some uh, fintechs uh, and some of the commentary that's been made here on uh, these outrageous levels of non-transparent. Uh, interest rates. Uh, Give some yes, thoughts on that. Absolutely. And thank you for the question. Um, in our experience, entrepreneurs have some clear market demands, and I just want to outline what those demands are. One is transparency. Two is simplicity. Three is affordability. And fourth is expediency. Uh, Camino Financial, we try to meet these demands for our borrowers in the most responsible and cost-effective way. And I do want to underscore to the second part of your question the importance of transparency. I recognize that there are bad actors in this industry that have over-anchored on one of those particular principles, which has been underscored in this by this committee, expediency over transparency. And so we're proud members of the Responsible Business Lending Coalition to show a united front, front among those good actors in the industry that we care about these issues, that our underlying intention is to leverage technology to effectively bring down the cost of distributing and transacting, which ultimately benefits our borrowers. Okay, good, good. Um, Mr. Griffin, I'm gonna come back to you for a moment. The, uh, the idea of CFPB um, having an authority over uh, small business lending over over fintechs. Uh, your thoughts? Good idea. Uh, not a good idea. Um, your your thoughts on that? Well, I realize this is a very partisan issue, but I do think the CFPB does play a role uh, to to provide different uh, different perspective on on um, overseeing overseeing some of the. Um, predatory practices. 
So I have noted, I, I investigate fraud and I look at um, which organization, I, I look at, I also talk to various government organizations. And what, one pattern that I notice is sometimes the one organization will pick up on something and, and someone else may not. And it may be because of kind of exogenous reasons. So I kind of, I am a fan for uh, more data being available, not just to government organizations, but to the public to analyze these these matters. So yeah, I, I'm, and, I am, so I'm sorry, I, I, we are over our time and I just want to say, we want to get it right, not be partisan. And Mr. Salas, yeah. I'd like to get your response to that in writing or after this. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman, the gentleman yields back. And now I recognize the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Salas, congratulations to Camino Financial for recently being approved as a U.S. Treasury certified Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI. As a mission-based lender, you're one of a small group of fintech lenders with a CDFI certification demonstrating your commitment to promoting community development and providing responsible, affordable capital and technical assistance to underserved minority-owned small businesses. You're also one of the few uh, fintech lenders that has voluntarily signed onto a small business borrower Bill of Rights, which commits you to fair business practices, including disclosing the true complete cost of your products. Uh, Mr. Salas, can you discuss why Camino Financial chose to sign on to the Small Business Borrower Bill of Rights and how being a signatory benefits your business? And what would you say to encourage other fintech small business lenders to join you? Uh, thank you for your kind words and your question. Um, I will say that uh, becoming a CDFI has been a long-term bet that we know is a winning bet. Uh, it took us three years to get certified in multiple applications as one of the first, if not the first, digitally native CDFI with a national designation focus on small business lending. So we're proud to be a CDFI and appreciate the question. Um, what can? We, why did we sign the Borrow Bill of Rights? Simply put, it was the right thing to do because it's in the best interest of our borrowers and it underscores guiding principles or guardrails of responsible lending in our industry. Uh, and and uh, I encourage other fintechs to do the same. And if you don't, we're going to put you out of business. <laughs> well, I also appreciate the fact that Camino Financial is pursuing a community advantage lending license with the SBA. Uh, you know, community advantage is something that could benefit small businesses so tremendously if they had greater access to it. And um, uh, because fintech lenders are much more likely to serve the smallest businesses unable to access products from traditional lenders, they're kind of going after the same uh, market. Um, and compared to the misleading advertising, some fintech companies used to trap businesses in unaffordable loans with high interest rates. Community advantage loans have a maximum interest rate of prime plus 6.5%, which is far below the nearly 50% we've seen in some parts of the fintech market. Community advantage lenders also provide their clients with technical assistance that some fintechs may not. Uh, I have long been a proponent for making uh, community advantage programs permanent, and I was pleased to see that the SBA recently raised the moratorium on new lenders in the program, of which you are one that is applying. Can you tell, tell us why you're pursuing this license and about how bringing more lenders in, into community advantage loan pro, into this program could potentially help more small businesses out of predatory, unaffordable loan products? Absolutely. Um, excuse my excitement because I think this is one of the biggest opportunities to systematically lower the cost of capital to underserved small businesses. Uh, we believe that the extension and permanent implementation of the SBA Community Advantage Program presents a great opportunity to increase that accessibility. Let me illustrate with how I believe Camino Financial would apply this program. Uh, we know and acknowledge that many underserved small businesses on the day of their application may actually not qualify for the Community Advantage Program. And so why do I think and I believe that it's going to drastically bring down the cost? It's because we call ourselves Camino for a reason. We're not just your starting point, we're your end point. 
it's important that we not only offer you an affordable and accessible loan at the onset that may not be an SBA loan, but give you the path to graduate into an SBA loan. And unfortunately today, as you know, SBA licenses are very hard to come by <laughs> unless you buy a bank. And, uh, but there's an opportunity as a CDFI to participate in SBA loan programs and be able to offer what I qualify as, if not the lowest, some of the lowest prices available to these underserved communities. And uh, to follow up, um, the Community Advantage Program was uh, extended for two years, but would making the program permanent provide the certainty needed for lenders to participate? Yes. Oh, uh, Thank you. I, we, we never heard a witness just say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> the gentle lady <laughs> yields back. Uh, and with that, I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Griffin, I, I think it would be wrong for us uh, to have the hearing on fintech lending and not discuss uh, Section 1071 of Dodd-Frank. Since CFPB uh, issued its proposed rule, I've heard uh, from several financial institutions about the negative impact that this will have on both small banks and small businesses. Even uh, CFPB Director Chopra expressed concern regarding the regulatory burden the proposed rule would have on small banks. Uh, but it's not just traditional institutions that would feel the effect of 1071. Non-bank lenders and fintechs would meet the 25 covered credit transaction requirement that will be subject to the same data collection burdens as other financial institutions. Uh, the result of this proposed rule will be fewer loans and decreased access to credit for small businesses. Uh, I want to thank the ranking member uh, ranking member Lukenmeyer for his leadership on this issue, including sending a letter to the director outlining the concerns of small business committee members uh, with the proposed rule. Uh, I would, I'd also like to submit that for the record if, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair. I would also be introducing a bill this month to repeal Section 1071 and require small business advocacy review panels to presume tailoring is necessary for rulemaking. Uh, Dr. Griffin, can you elaborate on how Section 1071 reporting requirements are burdensome to small businesses? Yeah, thanks. I'm uh, well. I'm not a. I'm not an expert on 1071, but I'll. I will. I will just say I, I'm not in favor of uh, having additional reporting requirements for small businesses. I would. I. I, I favor like the SBA having authority to investigate if they see um, consumer or predatory loans, but in terms of additional reporting, uh, reporting um, requirements on small businesses, that could be, I would see where that could be burdensome. It, it would seem that I, I, the kind of data that I'm, I'm requiring, or I would like to see more public transparency of is data that, that is already collected um, in terms of when loans are made, there's a lot of features to those loans, and that data could be ma made available by the SBA or the CFPB or other government organizations so that private individuals and academics like myself can in investigate the data and, and, and uh, look for misreporting. Yeah, I mean, one of the corporations actually located in my congressional is Fiserv, and with the literally millions of transactions that happen on a daily basis, I think putting fintech into kind of the same category and then saying that the same requirements that would apply to any type of traditional financial institution could also be accommodated by these corporations is just, well, first of all, naive. Uh, and secondly, once again, kind of the heavy hand of government stepping in and saying, uh, you know, we're going to require something that, quite honestly, we're not even sure whether or not they could provide. Uh, so, do you, I mean, do you think, like you said, you may not be an expert on that topic, but, uh, you know, codifying Section 1071 for non-bank and fintech, uh, it, it, it just doesn't seem like a good fit. It, would, you, would you agree with that? Uh, you know, I'd, I, again, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not comfortable making a, a up or down decision on it without knowing more details. But I would, I would say that uh, fintechs 
along with traditional banks already collect a lot of information. So I would favor whatever information they're existing collecting in their loans and so forth to, to uh, make all that data available to some reporting agencies. And that, that if they just simply did that, that would not require additional burdens. Burdens If they're, if they're requiring to, to give a survey to all their customers, then yes, that would be, that would be an additional burden, but just taking blanket downloads of the data they already collect and, and passing that on, I think that would be sensible, but that's probably not what the rule's about. But anyway. Yeah, and, and, and I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot. And I, I know it's we're into kind of an area that no one's really had to dive into yet. But the, the other thing I'll just say uh, in closing is when we looked at the PPP program and kind of the requirements and the financial institutions and the oversight that was um, obviously in place when you're talking about some of the small banks and credit unions, there was obviously much uh, less fraud. Uh, again, I don't know how we apply these things when you're talking about fintech with the scale and the size of, of what these companies are doing. Uh, so, I, you know, again, more of a comment than a question, I guess. I wish we would simply kind of avoid, avoid that if we could. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. I'm on. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is uh, always an interesting topic for me, considering the fact that a lot of reasons why we're in this issue with respect to the new innovations is because banking regulation in the United States has actually been terrible. It's actually crippled community banking in the United States. We all know it. That's why you've had so many different aspects of innovation that have matriculated because the desire for small borrowers, small businesses, micro businesses, and people at the, at the lower levels of our socioeconomic strata still need capital. They still got to borrow money. And the banking system as it exists today cannot meet the demand because of the ridiculous regulations brought from uh, previous iterations of Congress uh, a decade ago, two decades ago, so on and so forth. Um, I stand still in a position today that Dodd-Frank either needs to go completely or be completely reformed because what it actually did was cripple the ability for capital to reach some of the smallest enterprises in the United States. Uh, that being said, uh, Dr. Griffin, one of the reasons I'm, I have an issue with an expansion of CFPB's authority, which, by the way, the CFPB... Um, in my view, is not constitutional because they have there's no oversight authority from Congress for them to operate. They basically operate in the ether. And I know nobody likes to talk about that, but they do their own thing, and they literally leverage money from corporations um, with no oversight whatsoever from Congress. So I, my, for my purview, they're an unconstitutional uh, body. They should be removed. Um, just figure we might as well get that on the record right now. But... That being said, my issue with actually expanding their authority is that, won't, Dr. Griffin, do you think that it will make it harder for fintechs to actually be able to operate and provide capital to the people who still desire capital in the United States, uh, specifically around small business borrowing, micro business borrowing? Do you think the chairwoman's bill would actually make it harder for fintechs to meet the demand that obviously exists in the United States? Yeah, thanks for that that question. I mean, these are these are these are complex topics. I I would I would start by saying that I think um, I think oftentimes with regulation, there's 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 two approaches. One is to try to create a lot of safeguards on the front end to prohibit uh, potential problems on the back end, and um, there can be problems with that as our program. Um, as we showed with the PPP, there were substantial problems with the program. Now, we, could, we should always think about designing better programs and so forth, but uh, I am a big advocate, as I was mentioning at the end of my talk, of, of having stronger uh, consequences at the back end. And whether that comes from um, existing organizations like the Department of Justice, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or other regulatory bodies, perhaps the CFPB, I would, I would uh, have that to be more repercussions for organizations that violate the rules rather than creating a lot of uh, regulatory tape at the front end that could actually uh, 
because the, one of the problems with that regulatory tape at the front end is it does prohibit new competition and, and can actually entrench those people that are, um, that are able to navigate the rules, though, entrench those people in the market and, and actually cause, uh, you know, prohibit new competition. Well, I appreciate that. And, and one of the area I want to get on real quick, and I, I heard it in one of the witnesses' testimony earlier today, was about APRs and an, at the annual percentage rate. Um, listen, as a banker, from a recovering banker, because I'm not in the industry anymore, obviously, but as a recovering banker, you cannot, it has never worked to apply short-term uh, loans and subject them to APR calculations. The debt is only outstanding for a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, and you're going to apply an annual percentage uh, 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 calculation to it. The, a the APR, quote-unquote, might sound technically right, but the problem is, is that the credit is not extended for a full year. So it, it's you're comparing apples and oranges. That it just never has really made much sense to try to apply APR terms to some of these short-term lending instruments that are designed to be short-term, that are short-term. Uh, Dr. Griffin, last question to you uh, in the time remaining. Do you think that it's actually beneficial to these borrowers for to have these APR disclosures, which in my view are misleading anyway? Yeah, I, I actually disagree with you on that. I would like to see the APR disclosed. And if there are dis, um, if there are caveats, like the APR would only be for a certain period of time, they could disclose that, that, that if the loan is only for X months. But, um, but the one problem is if the loan is like only a month originally, but then it extends to a longer term, then it could end up being an APR. So I do think that transparency and giving accurate information to borrowers and putting, putting all the information on a level, level playing field so that borrowers can make the appropriate choices. I'm a finance professor, and I can tell you that sometimes I, uh, uh, my colleagues are confused by some of the terms in, in, various, uh, in various documents. So I do think there's, there's some role to transparency and putting, uh, putting things on a level playing field for better competition that way, actually. And the gentleman's time has expired. And uh, seeing no other uh, questions, uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for being here today. A new technology can expand access to timely credit for underserved entrepreneurs, increase financing options, and improve day-to-day -day operations for small businesses. But as we've seen today, these new technologies have also been used to take advantage of entrepreneurs. As a Congress, we must take steps to ensure that this rapidly developing sector has adequate protections for small businesses. Today, we've discussed several common sense policies, uh, from transparency uh, uh, policies to disclosure policies that can help root out predatory practices and ensure fairness for small business borrowers around the country. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance solutions that expand access to affordable capital while safeguarding small firms. Without objection, uh, members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. And without any further business to come before the committee, without objection, we are now adjourned. Thanks, everybody.